All right, so we're going to attempt to divide this up relatively uh, evenly. I'm going to say about six minutes worth of things on uh, production of data from international sources, and then we'll have a few minutes uh, from Gerald on protecting privilege during internal investigations. So there are three there are three approaches to obtaining uh, foreign evidence that I'm going to go over. First is the mutual legal assistance treaties. Second is uh, criminal code production orders that are available in Canada. And third, I'm going to take a quick dip down to the United States to talk briefly about developments in that jurisdiction on this issue. Uh, mutual legal assistance uh, treaties uh, are mechanisms by which local law enforcement can make requests. Uh, in Canada, they go to a central authority, which is the Minister of Justice, or in practice, the International Assistance Group at the Minister of Justice. Uh, we have currently, uh, or at least to 2014, 35 bilateral treaties with other countries, pursuant to which we can obtain uh, uh, evidence uh, through our partners. Uh, Canada is also party to a number of multilateral uh, agreements as well. These have been used in a number of court cases and I've given a couple of examples you'll see behind me. In the Groves case, a mutual legal assistance treaty framework was used to obtain Facebook, MSN and Skype messages uh, involving an individual who lives in the United Kingdom and in CAS uh, it was used to obtain Facebook messages from an individual uh, in the United States. Uh, how this works is local law enforcement make the request to the central agency in Canada. The central agency then makes that request to the partner's central agency, which is downloaded into their domestic system. Uh, for example, a, pr a request for search warrant or production is then uh, executed on the ground. That information, whatever is collected, is uploaded, then transferred back over to Canada and then back to local law enforcement. Uh, if you think that's a cumbersome process, you are right. Uh, the British Columbia Court of Appeal had a few comments recently on the limits of the MLAT process, including that there are many countries that aren't parties to uh, MLATs with Canada, and that it is a slow and uncertain mechanism of investigation in an era when information moves instantaneously and may be stored only for a short time. So what other options are there? Uh, the primary additional option Uh, is uh, criminal code production orders. Um, slides refuse to cooperate. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> you're missing the text of the criminal code production orders. Uh, in, in essence, uh, I do want to highlight two factors, two uh, um, criteria that must be met in order to obtain a production order. One is that it needs to be targeted to an individual uh, who is in Canada. And the other is uh, it has to relate to information in their possession or control. And again, the British Columbia Court of Appeal. There we go. I'm just going to skip a bit. Uh, the British Columbia Court of Appeal had a few things to say about the scope of this provision and the court's jurisdiction under this provision recently in a case in which uh, British Columbia law enforcement sought records from Craigslist related to a criminal investigation concerning a posting that had been made in British Columbia. Problem is Craigslist has its head office in San Francisco and has no office or operations physically in Canada. However, the British, court of, uh, British Columbia Court of Appeal found that having a virtual presence as Craigslist does in British Columbia was a sufficient uh, connection to the jurisdiction to make Craigslist a person in Canada for the purposes of the production order. Now subsequently and very recently the uh, uh, Newfoundland Provincial Court came along and disagreed with that particular interpretation of whether someone was a person in Canada uh, and that was a case in which uh, law enforcement sought uh, evidence in relation to um, sharing of nude photos through Facebook from a company that was physically located in the United States but had business operations in Canada including in Newfoundland and the court declined uh, to order a production order said it did not have the jurisdiction to do so and noted that Parliament cannot compel a person in a foreign jurisdiction 
to comply with the production order issued in Canada, and it has not attempted to do so. So we have some uh, diverging interpretations of this particular provision in the criminal code, something which I anticipate will be uh, litigated uh, currently and into the future. The second aspect of requiring someone to be in possession or control of materials that are sought through a production order was almost also commented upon uh, in uh, the Brecknell case, the British Columbia Court of Appeal. Uh, in that case, it was very clear that the evidence did not reside, the evidence that they were after did not reside in Canada, uh, but uh, it was very clear that the data uh, is within the possession or control of a person uh, who's subject to an order, um, even if it is located uh, outside of Canada, if someone has possession or control of it. And the court there drew on a decision of the Federal Court of Appeal in eBay uh, about 10 years earlier, where the com court commented upon this, uh, this specific issue and acknowledged that with the click of a mouse, somebody can pull up on their screen in Toronto data that is actually stored uh, halfway across the world, halfway around the world. And it makes no sense in the view of the court to insist that information stored on servers outside Canada and that is accessible in this manner uh, as a matter of law is located outside of Canada. So the two takeaways from these recent cases are say the two takeaways from the British Columbia Court of Appeal case are one, you can have a virtual presence in Canada and be considered to be a person in Canada for the purposes of obtaining a production order. And the second thing is an <coughs> affirmation that one can be in possession of and control of digital evidence in Canada, even though that evidence is, st is stored on a server in another jurisdiction. And I was quickly going to take us uh, into a recent case in the, the United States uh, the Second Circuit Court of Appeal made a ruling uh, in the United States uh, versus Microsoft Corp case, uh, which I won't dwell on. The, the effect of it uh, essentially was it was argued at the Supreme Court of the United States earlier this year, uh, put on reserve. The question was, does the statute that governs production orders in the United States uh, allow for uh, compelling data to be uh, provided under the order? where the company targeted by the order is in the United States, but that data is elsewhere, in this case in Ireland. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, that was ruled moot, uh, or submitted to the court that it was moot by the parties in the face of the enactment of something called the Cloud Act, very cleverly named, that made it clear that regardless of where it is located, uh, whether inside or outside the United States, a production order can compel production of data uh, regardless of where it's situated. So those are my six minutes on data Great. outside of Canada. So I'm going to spend the remaining uh, brief amount of time making sure that we all get our professionalism hours by talking a little bit about privilege. And uh, so, you know, Pam talked a little bit about what happens if, if the state is conducting an investigation, criminal or regulatory, by seeking your data. Uh, uh, either domestically or from some other jurisdiction. What happens, let's say, if the corporation decides that it's going to get ahead of the issue or for whatever other reason wants to conduct its own internal investigation, how does it protect privilege while doing so? Well, the first uh, issue, of course, to look at is solicitor-client privilege. That's the one I'm not going to spend much time on because it's less exciting uh, to my mind other than to highlight the fact that there is case law, high authority from the United States, Supreme Court of the United States, saying that solicitor client privilege can extend to the communications that a lawyer has with the corporation's employees in the course of learning facts so that they can provide legal advice. Some provincial appellate court authority from Canada, bear in mind, however, that the UK has recently gone in another direction, or at least uh, recently affirmed uh, the previous case law in the UK going in the other direction in the case of uh, Eurasian Natural Resources Corporation. That's under appeal, so stay tuned. More exciting for uh, the purposes this morning, or this, this evening, it's been a long day, um, <laughs> our litigation privilege. And this is particularly useful for internal investigations because it can extend to communications that you have with third parties, namely suppliers and customers, and not just with the employees of the corporation, if solicitor client privilege even extends that far. We all know the test for litigation privilege. Communications or the documents have to be prepared for the dominant purpose of anticipated or existing litigation. What if the documents or the communications are had for the dominant purpose of preparing for an anticipated investigation? So what if you're one step before prosecution in the case of a criminal or regulatory case? Is that sufficient to trigger 
litigation privilege. Well, we've got conflicting case law very recently out of the UK. The Eurasian Natural Resources Corporation that I referred to earlier said no privilege, drew a bright line between an investigation, an investigation and the ensuing prosecution, although I imagine most practitioners, including myself, would take a considerably dimmer view of that sort of bright line. And the same courts uh, months later took a, a different view uh, and the Eurasian Natural Resources case is under appeal, so we'll get some clarity coming uh, out of the UK. This is the case that took a different view out of the UK, and you see the quote at the bottom, the, the company in this case conducted an investigation to fend off an assessment on whether it had overclaimed 86 uh, million pounds in VAT, and the court said fending off this assessment was just part of the continuum that formed the road to litigation that was considered rightly as it turned out to be almost inevitable so a much more practical view at least to my mind of when something is conducted for the dominant purpose of pending litigation uh, here oh i don't know what happened there let's see if we can go back okay this slide deck is out of control <laughs> uh, so i'm not even going to attempt to okay here we go all right ignore the slide <laughs> There is a case, I'm just going to close on this note. There is a case, and we're going to come back to Canada, that is critically important. Leave to appeal a sought to the Supreme Court of Canada. It's a case called Assessment Direct, trial level decision of Justice Nordheimer's before he was elevated to the Court of Appeal. And the case stands for this basic proposition witness statements, even when prepared for the dominant purpose of anticipated litigation, that was not in dispute in this case. Witness statements, if they contain only facts, so imagine a recording or a transcript, those are not protected by litigation privilege because there is a difference between facts, the case says, on the one hand, and counsel's thoughts, observations, and strategy on the other hand. That's what this case says. I think it's wrong. It has been, leave has, to appeal has been sought to the Supreme Court of Canada. I'll just end with a bit of a rant in terms of what I hope the Supreme Court will do because no presentation is sufficient without a rant. <laughs> As with the other bright line in the UK case, it is, a, it is a fairly simplistic distinction to draw a line between facts in a transcript of a witness statement and counsel's thoughts, observations, and opinions because as every lawyer in the room knows, even the transcript of a Q&A can reveal counsel's thoughts and strategy in terms of the questions that the lawyer chose to ask and the facts that the lawyer chose to elicit. And I think this case confuses what we mean, sorry, that's my phone, uh, when we talk about facts not covered by privilege. What the cases typically mean when they say facts are not covered by privilege is that anybody is free to go talk to the witness and elicit the same facts if you know what questions to ask. What the cases do not, in my view or submission, mean is that the summary of the facts in the form of a witness statement, whether it's a transcript or notes of counsel or whatever, are not protected by privilege. But in Ontario, we do now have this case which draws this stark distinction, so we'll see what the Supreme Court of Canada does when they decide to leave application in the coming months. Thank you very much.